This is a very short introduction to the field of historical linguistics, in particular to the idea that languages are grouped into language families, that similar languages like French, Spanish, Italian are all grouped together precisely because of those similarities. They are clustered together because of their similarities, if you will. And the way we figure out if two languages are similar is precisely by looking at their features, at what words uh, look similar amongst them. Languages change. Languages change all the time, every day. Imagine when you were in high school. You had your group of friends, and every now and then people came up with a new word to say cool, like, that's so blap, something like that. Um, and the idea was, you know, for people in the know to say, oh, that's so blap, oh, the blap thing last night. For your friends to know the word, and for your mom not to know the word. If you caught your mom saying, hey, I saw something that is so blap, you would go like, oh my God, mom, please don't say that. So in uh, human communities, there's always a constant tension between wanting people in your group or in your community to understand you and wanting those that are not in your immediate group not to understand you. And of course, these groups are defined dynamically according to the identities we perform. If we want to... Uh, be in a context where we're, you know, with our cool friends, we use the word blap amongst themselves, but it, we cannot have our mom use it, or we cannot have the teachers use the word. And some of those words will go out of usage and we'll never hear them again. Some of them will stick and keep on going. If you fast forward that process, you know, we're... Um, a group introduces a tiny change here and a tiny change there, and some of them stick. And you fast forward that for a couple hundred years. Over time, enough changes will accumulate that not only will your friends be speaking differently, but maybe different neighborhoods or cities will be speaking differently. That eventually different regions will have different words, different sounds, and different accents. Indeed, not only words change, but also the way we produce sounds. Uh, English has many dialects, so someone from England doesn't sound the same as someone from the US and someone from New Zealand. All those changes happen very slowly over time, and they happen to all human languages. Every human language is always changing. And again, if you let the movie uh, go for a couple hundred years, you're going to see that you're going to end up with things that look very different from what you started with. Even to this day, English is changing. And again, it will continue to change. Right now, for example, some ways in which English is different um, from the English of your parents or your grandparents is that you can use they as a singular. So sentences like everybody came in their car in the 21st century means that People came in the cars belonging to each of them. For uh, your grandparents, this, was the, this would have meant something like everyone came in the car of those people over there, in the plural meaning. This is one change that's happening in the 21st century. There's other changes in present-day English. For example, uh, before, the only way to say the sentence in number two would have been, so Karen says, wow, I wish I'd been there. In the early 21st century, we usually say things like, so Karen goes, wow, I wish I'd been there. So Karen's like, wow, I wish I'd been there. So Karen's all, wow, I wish I'd been there. So these new forms have been emerging for a while. Also things like the word whom, um, whom am I seeing, for example. No one really uses it anymore, and people only people who want to project an extremely pedantic persona would use that word. Uh, Modern-day English really doesn't have it. So this is English in the 20th century. If we go back a few steps, maybe, I'm sorry, not the 20th century, the 21st century. If we go back 400 years into the 1600s, you would have Romeo and Juliet, for example where the words are similar, but the pronunciation was different. 
And as a matter of fact, I leave you a link there so you can listen to what Shakespeare sounded like, which I cannot say. So I will just say the first two lines. Two households both alike in dignity and fair Verona, where we lay our scene. You can see that the words are similar. Every now and then you're going to find a word that you don't understand, but you can pretty much read this without much effort. The sounds are different, but the language is still the same. Let's go back a little bit further maybe around 600 years. These are, the first, uh, these are the first lines of a book called the Canterbury Tales. And the first lines would have sounded something like this. One that April with a show is sorted, the drochte of March hath pierced to the rote, and bathed every vein in swish liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the floor. When April with its sweet-smelling showers had, has pierced the drought of March to the root. So you can see that, first of all, it sounds very different. Second, many of the words are different. Um, for example, sorte at the end of the first line would mean sweet. Also, the positions are different. We would say sweet showers. They would say shower sweet, show the sorte. So, in, so 600 years has meant quite a bit of change for English. Let's step back even further. This is from about a thousand years ago, from a poem called Beowulf. And the first lines are, Huet, we gardena in gerdagum, third kuning gathrum gefrunum, huda ethelingas elem fremedon. Lo, praise of the prowess of people kings, of spear armed Danes, in days long sped. If you look at this language, first of all, I wouldn't understand anything <laughs> if you place this in front of me. The words are really different. Second, if anything, it looks like Icelandic or German uh, or Scandinavian language. This is not an accident. We can find many words in languages like German and Icelandic that are very similar to words in English. And the further back we go, the more all of these languages are going to start resembling one another. In modern day English, uh, the word fish for example, is very similar to Dutch fis, German fish, Danish fisk, Swedish fisk, and Icelandic fiskur. And in an older stage of English, it wasn't. It was pronounced fisk, like uh, in Swedish and Danish, for example. You can see this written in runes in this object, the uh, Frank's casket, which shouldn't have the apostrophe. The first four characters are the runes for fisk. So again, all of these words are um, very similar. There's one concept, fish, which is very similar across all of these languages. If you will, a feature, how you say the word fish, which has a very similar representation in all of these. These would form a group called the Germanic languages. As you can see, Germanic languages include German and dialects of German, English, Icelandic, and the languages of Scandinavia. But Germanic is just a tiny component of a much larger family called Indo-European. So sometime around 5,000 to 7,000 years ago, somebody must have spoken some language called Indo-European. And then the group of people that spoke that language separated. Some people went as far down as India, for example. Some people went to Italy. Some people went to Central Europe. And as they went along, their words started changing. Again, same process where you had some words in high school that you used with your friends, but not with your mom, for example. All of these tiny changes in pronunciation, in words, uh, added up over time. Sometimes change is accidental, like a biological mutation. Um, you have a baby that instead of saying R, it starts saying R, for example. So for the people who spoke Indo-European, um, they must have had a word for I, like ego or egg home. The people who walked to Italy, as they went along, that word changed from ecom 
to ego. And then from Italy, as uh, people went into Iberia, into other parts of Central Europe, the word ego from Latin changed into jo for Spanish, eu for, for Portuguese, je for French, io for Italian. Going back, people uh, spoke in the European and the word I was egum. The ones that left for India, their word probably changed into something like ajam, and then it became Sanskrit aham, and, and ultimately became Hindi me, for example, or Gujarati hu. This also happened for Germanic. They had egum at first, and then the people who went to Central Europe started saying that word ik, until eventually it became I for English, ish for German, and yag for Swedish. So we have a family, Indo-European, and we had some previous form that then changed into the languages that we see today. As you can see, there's many other languages in Indo-European. Russian, for example, Ukrainian, Polish are in one part of the family. Uh, Greek, Armenian, um, Farsi, the Persian should be there somewhere as well. Uh, there's many languages. Albanian. Let's give a couple more examples of language families. There's another family spoken by students in the class called Afroasiatic. So Afroasiatic includes languages like Arabic, uh, includes Ge'ez, which is like the classical language of Amharic, and includes other languages, as you can see. And we know that these are related because their words are similar. The word tongue, for example, is lisan in Arabic. It's lisan in Ge'ez. It's Nes in Middle Egyptian. You can see it there with the hieroglyphs. It's um, Harshe in Hausa, for example, and Araba in Oromo. So there's things that are L's or R's in many of these words. There's things that are S in many of the words. And that's how we know that they're connected. Uh, a final example of a language family. This family is called Sino-Tibetan. This is the language that Ma uh, the language family that Mandarin become, belongs to. So, um, in the proto language in the proto Sino Tibetan, as you can see in Table One, the word "I" must have been something like "ngai" or "ngai." This word changed into "nga" as it went into Old Chinese, and then from "nga," you see the variations we see in the languages of China today. In Mandarin. Nga became wo. In Hakka, for example, at the far right of the table, Nga became Ngai. And in Cantonese, Nga became Ngo. So you can see here how there are systematic changes as you go from the older forms to the newer forms. Uh, Sino Tibetan includes other languages like Bodo from Indian, India, where Nga became Ang and Yi from China, where Nga became Nga. So there are many language families in the world. Um, we know that things should be clustered together because we find similarities in words, uh, consistent regularities. We're going to call those sound correspondences. For example, um, these are languages from the Austronesian family. They're called Tongan, Samoan, Tahitian, Maori, and Hawaiian. Mm, let's look at the word for bird. This is manu, 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 manu for all the languages. This means that there was probably a word like manu in the original language where the M changed, didn't change and became M in all of the daughter languages. Likewise, there, were, there was a sound like N, which remained N in all of the other languages. So uh, there's a correspondence of M, 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 M in all of these. And by the way, when you have a feature or a word that has related forms, we call that a cognate. So Manu, Manu, so Tongan Manu is a cognate of Samoan Manu and of Tahitian Manu and of Maori Manu and of Hawaiian Manu. These are cognates. And that's how we're going to cluster a language family by finding cognates. Sounds can change. The word for canoe, for example, 
maybe it was something like vaca or waka. It had some initial sound that became a V in Tongan vaca, in Samoan vaa, in Tahitian vaa. That same sound became a W in Maori waka and Hawaiian waa. So whatever the original sound was, there's now a regular correspondence between Tongan and Samoan and Tahitian V and Maori and Hawaiian W. Likewise, for the central consonant, there must have been something there that became a K in Tongan Vaka, in Maori Waka. And that same something be became a glottal stop in Samoan Va'a, in Tahitian Va'a, and in Hawaiian Wa'a. So some sound became a K sometimes and a glottal stop a -a sometimes. And again, the Tongan word Vaka is a cognate for Samoan Va'a and for Maori Waka and for Hawaiian Wa. These are cognates. Maybe the protoform in in the protoform of this language was something like Manu or something like Vaka. The process of deciding what a protoform should look is called comparative linguistics. It's a branch of historical linguistics. So as a quick summary, languages are always changing. The, uh, it's natural, all living things change, and this happens to every single language. So every language that we have today is equally old. Languages are clustered together in language families, and the main way we know that they belong in the same cluster is because they share cognates, words that have uh, regular, consistent similarities between them. We're going to use these principles to produce a tree, a clustered tree, of the Indo-European family.